Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here. I have with me Sarah Zanton, the Health Equity and Social Justice Endowed Professor and the Director of the Center for Innovative a Care in Aging at the John Hopkins School of Nursing. Um, Sarah, her, Sarah's work focuses particularly on ways to help older adults age in place. Um, she is the co-founder of the Community Aging in Place, Advancing Better Living for Elders Capable program that I wrote about in my last column. And we pre hope to have a wide-ranging conversation here about all of the issues surrounding this. Um, please send in your comments. We want to hear from you. We're going to be um, addressing your questions during the course of this broadcast, which will last for about an hour. Um, let me start with um, a question for Sarah that people are familiar with the term aging in place. You refer to your work as helping people age with independence. Um, what does this mean? Um, I realize I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Judy Graham. I'm the Navigating Aging columnist for Kaiser Health News. My column appears every two weeks. And as I said, my last column was on Sarah's program, Capable. Great. So delighted to have oh, you here. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank so you. So tell us about aging with independence. Sure, yeah. So um, people often talk about aging in place, which is also a, a fine term. But to me, it sounds a little stuck, like someone could be aging in concrete. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're in place. Um, and I think what we all want is um, to age with independence, so to age with choice, to age with some autonomy, um, and to do that, we cr try to create the conditions where someone can have the life they want. And uh, the reason that's somewhat of synonym with aging in place is people often want to age at home. Most people want to stay in their original home, in their community, to be able to do what they would like to be able to do. Right. So what stands in the way of doing that successfully, aging with independence? Right, so um, there are many things, some of which are our abilities often can change as we get older, either in terms of our physical abilities or our, our home can be changing, can be falling apart around us, um, and then our fit with the environment. So if, for example, if, if we become shorter and our cabinets aren't shortening on their own, um, it can be harder to reach into them, as a, as a small example. Mm -hmm. Or if it becomes harder to go upstairs and there's no bedroom on the first floor, that fit can be more difficult between the person and the environment. Um, and then the um, in terms of a lot of older adults haven't been able to save for retirement and Social Security in some cases can be as little as $400 a month. Mm -hmm. So there's also the challenge of um, how to be able to age with independence at home on very meager resources. Oh, that's a, a huge challenge. Yeah. What promotes aging with independence? If those are some of the challenges, what are the things that allow people to do it right. successfully? So um, I think there's societal answers and there's family answers and individual answers. Mm -hmm. Societally, um, we can talk more also about how to promote older, abilities, older adults' abilities to age with independence. Um, I think listeners are often thinking about what can I do or what can I do for my mother? And so to address the individual, um, you know, the, some of the biggest things are focusing on strength and balance, especially ahead of time, but it's never too late. You know, even in the last months of life, people can grow muscle strength. Mm. So um, thinking of creating kind of a reserve of, of strength and balance, it, whether it's walking or, or dancing or whatever someone likes to do, then of course, um, being able, and we mentioned affordability, that is, an, um, whether you can afford what you want is a balance between one's income and one's expenses. And we've been able to find a lot of times where people have expenses that they, they don't even really need. You know, for example, a life insurance policy for someone who's 85 who has no dependents and they're still paying $200 a month. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the, that sometimes you can go through and free up some resources mm -hmm. to be able to age with independence. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned family context and social context as well. Yeah, exactly. So um, when people, so for example, if someone may have a difficult time getting to the store, um, a lot of times, you know, neighbors, neighbors or family members will, will bring them groceries, and, and then they're still able to be in their home. Um, and people with resources often, you know, can, can have, you know, food delivered. Or there's, there's many things that are coming 
um, to fruition now through the internet and our phones that um, will really help aging with independence as well. So the program that I wrote about, um, you had told me when we spoke earlier that mm -hmm. when you went as a nurse into people's homes, you saw things that made you realize that we can actually intervene and make things better for people. Can you describe um, perhaps one of the experiences sure. that you had going to a home and how that led you to sure. rethink um, what might be possible in terms of helping sure. older adults? Sure. So as a nurse, I did house calls, and um, I often found people who had to um, drop their keys from the second floor window to let me in because they couldn't get down to their first floor at all, or people who greeted me on their hands and knees um, because they uh, couldn't they couldn't walk or on their, their hands on their and hands knees? and knees, and people who had to go up their stairs on their hands and knees, and this was so shocking to me. Um, and thinking of one in particular, a woman who she was 101. And she lived in a um, public housing situation that was going to be demolished soon. And so she, um, there were, it was more and more vacant around her. And she couldn't read. Um, she had to pay a neighbor to help her with her bills. And she had to pay a neighbor to take out her trash. And she got around the apartment in a wheelchair. Uh, she could sometimes stand. And she had to stand and then get on her knees uh, to go into the kitchen because the wheelchair couldn't go in there. And she would just grab at what food that she could oh grab. Goodness. And um, when together with social workers from the place where I was um, a nurse practitioner, uh, we got her moved to a senior building that was a brand new, beautiful, not scary, filled with uh, lovely neighbors, um, some of whom were 50 years younger than her because she was 101 and you only had to be 50 mm. to move in. And I was able to take her off of two of her diabetes medicines and two of her blood pressure medicines just from the change in the environment. And that was so striking to me because I thought, this is the same body, same person, same life experience. She's, ex you know, um, and it's just the environment that's changed. And that really got me thinking moving forward about this fit between a person and their environment and what they need. Um, and she could, and there her wheelchair could get through every door. And so um, together with Laura Gitlin and other colleagues, we developed Capable, partly based on those experiences. Right, because sometimes when people age, you can't really change them. You can't change the conditions that they might have, but you can change the environment in which they live. Talk about how that happens through your program. Right, so um, Capable is a time-limited program. It's four months. And it's a combination of a nurse, an occupational therapist, and a handyman, handy worker, handy person, um, and directly to work on what older adults want to be able to do. And we provide the, the clinical judgment and experience from the nurse and the OT, occupational therapist, um, and change the house through the home modification bu budget based exactly on what they want to do. So it might be to be able to sleep in their own bed instead of on the couch or it might be to be able to get down the stairs and into their daughter's car to go see a friend. Um, or it's, it's completely based on what they say they would like to be able to do. That's so powerful. Talk, talk more about, do, when you talk to people about what it is they want, these older adults, is that top of mind, that their goals? Is there, how do you elicit right. those essential, this is what is really important to right. me? So for some people, yes, you barely get your bag in the door and they say, I really want to do such and such. Um, I want to be able to cook food for my grandson. He comes over once a week and I am not able to stand long enough to cook, you know, or I really want to take a bath on my own. You know, some, sometimes that's completely top of mind. Other times um, it comes after and most usually it comes after a session of talking about the different kinds of things like bathing or getting dressed or getting out of the house or grooming that um, might be areas they might want to focus on and then they decide based on those what we, what they would like. So for example, we had a gentleman recently whose, whose goal was to stand up while shaving. He was shaving in a wheelchair and getting himself messy and it was a dignity um, you know, draw back to him. And um, we didn't, he didn't say that right when we walked in the door. It was more going through things, him talking about what's difficult and what he prioritizes. Is that something that family members can do? Absolutely. Talk, give some thoughts about how, if you were a family member or a friend of an older adult and you wanted to understand what they were having difficulty with 
and also what their goals might be, how you might approach that kind of conversation. Right. So um, definitely family members can help someone understand what they would like to be able to do and um, in any of these areas. The, the nurses and the occupational therapists are clinically trained to, um, to use their pattern recognition you know, from, other, from other patients and other clients um, and their clinical knowledge of being able to pull apart tasks to understand what, what is changeable. So I think understanding what they want to be able to do is kind of the easy part, but then um, helping them be able to do it with the resources might not be something a family member could do. But how would you as a family member approach that kind of conversation? Yeah, so, um, I mean, just very simply, um, you know, mom or dad, let's, let's talk about things that you would like to be able to do that you might not be able to do currently. Why don't we start with what's a typical day like for you? Mm. And um, when are you usually getting up? And, oh, and how do you like that? And um, do you usually see some, you know, to kind of get a sense of, of what the day is like for them and then what they, what they wish that day would be like would be a, one way of starting. One of the issues that I encounter a lot in my reporting on this topic is people who want their older parents to do something and mm. the older parent is resisting and saying no, no, or even if they say yes, they actually don't do it. Um, is there a way to reframe those kinds of interactions using the, you know, this approach of trying to elicit goals? Right, so one of the, uh, you, you're right, that's a huge issue and um, in, in geriatrics, we often talk about the trade-off between safety and autonomy. And as an example, um, we sometimes say that we value autonomy for ourselves and safety for the people we love. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, if you think if you have a 16-year-old child, that 16-year-old child really wants to learn to drive, you're nervous about it, right? And so you're thinking more about their safety and maybe your car safety, um, and they're thinking about being able to go places. And that doesn't change. You know, when you're 90, you don't want your daughter or son to be saying, you really need to be doing this, and I, it's important that you do that. Um, that that as, as humans, we value autonomy and agency and independence. Of course, that's somewhat culturally based, um, but not completely. And um, that... I think just this maybe the simplest mind shift for um, for a grown child who's, tr who's you know trying to get their their parent to do something is to think what how would they like it if their child was asking them to do something differently and how to fr how to frame it it's it's really um, no matter how old or frail someone is it's still it's th it's their life. Mm. Can you give an example of reframing? Does one come to mind? Um, well. I guess um, maybe if, if there were a particular story, that would be easy. I mean, our whole our whole approach in Capable is from that new frame, so we don't have the reframing as much, I okay. guess. Okay, I understand. We have a question here from Karen. Um, what kind of financial burdens are families and loved ones absorbing as our population ages and needs informal caregiving? Right, so um, families are absorbing extensive costs across the country and across the socioeconomic strata um, involving time off from work to take uh, um, you know family members to appointments um, paying for direct care workers out of out of pocket um, you know buying things for them redoing their house a little bit I think um, that it's a it's a huge need that some families are able to absorb better than others, and from a policy point of view, it's something we should really be um, addressing as a society. Right, and your program, talk about the costs of your program and mm -hmm. the savings associated and where they come from. Sure, so the capable program that we mentioned um, costs about $3,000 per person over that four months, and that includes the, um, the time of the clinicians and of the home repair. And it saves about $30,000, it seems, so far. So it same, saves about 10 times what it costs. And we've, um, other sites have started to do it, and they've also saved more than it, uh, more than it costs. So you know, it's early days in terms of getting an exact figure. But um, it seems to be that the, that the um, bulk of the savings is from reduced hospitalizations and nursing home admissions. I think we have a question here, which is how can Medicare 
and Medicaid help meet the needs of those who live at home and need more help? Well, so that's a great question. And Medicare is, um, I don't want to get too, <laughs> too, too down in the weeds. Uh, Medicare is available to anyone over 65, and two-thirds of Americans have the traditional Medicare, and one-third have what's called Medicare Advantage, and they have slightly different rules. Mm -hmm. Medicare Advantage has more leeway for what um, it can pay for, specifically in the last year or so, can pay for things like um, direct care workers or supplemental benefits. Medicaid is very restricted to people who are, who are quite poor, um, or who have been in a nursing home for long enough that they have become quite poor mm -hmm. or their families become quite poor. And so um, I think they're, they're great platforms to build from, um, but they're not the total answer. I think um, people have reached out to me since my article and said, how do I find services for my mother or right. for myself of the kind that you propose in your article, especially if I don't live in a city where your right. program is now being offered in 26 locations, right. but it's not that widely available. Right. And many people are thinking, are, are wondering where they can find help, either with the um, home repairs side of things or having somebody come in and help them um, understand how to do things differently to ease the burden of, of living independently. Um, can you give us some right. thoughts about right. where to find those kinds of resources? Um, so we developed Capable partly because there was this gap, right? There isn't just a natural place to turn to for for these um, for our innovation. But that said, um, some it really differs across the country. Um, people could turn to their what's called their area agency on aging, and this is called different things, different places. For example, in Philadelphia, it's called the Philadelphia Corporation on Aging. But if, if you, um, uh, and sometimes it's in the health department, but every city and county has what's called an area agency on aging that um, is findable, that's, that some of them have good resources. Uh, separate from that, there's a um, program called Rebuilding Together that's in many cities and counties that's, uh, um, that's about home mod modification for older adults. Some Meals on Wheels programs have home modification, and um, some carpenters unions have programs, really? and some vocational and technological high schools have um, programs, and there's some AmeriCorps programs throughout. So it's very scattershot, and I guess I would say that the difference between um, that work and and capable is that we have it as you know clinician guided, and um, it involves things like um, sturdy step stools or a special cutting board that you wouldn't have from a handyman repair. Right, the handyman is more about the home, oh, and that's so um, it's not really it's a, it's a part of what we do. So if um, I see another question came in, but if people want to find out about these programs, they should start by calling their area agency on aging or the county department on yeah. aging and just ask right. what's available in the right. area. Okay, here's another question that's come in. Um, what can be done about depression and pain? Very common in the older population and my guess is in the homebound older population. Right. A, a, a concern that needs to be addressed. Right. Um, very important question, very important area. And for the nursing part of Capable, I know we're not just talking about Capable, but just mm -hmm. as a lens, um, the nurses' domains are depression, pain, strength and balance, primary care provider communication, and medications. And so we ask everyone if they have goals around either their mood or pain. And, and we were very surprised that we have in our first study, 300 older adults who were low income, who weren't necessarily homebound, they just had some difficulty with some self-care, and 84% had either moderate or extreme pain oh my goodness. in the last week. So, um, um, so in terms of what can be done, um, a lot of depression and pain are interrelated, or they can be. Not everyone who's in pain is depressed, and, and the same, you know, not everyone who's depressed is in pain, but they can cause a cycle together where um, you're in pain and it's harder to do things, and then your mood gets lower. And um, so part of it is um, trying to change the cycle back so that you are, you know, once you are able to do something that you wanted to be able to do, maybe you're less likely to notice the pain, you know, so, and other things, um, we use behavioral activation methods, um, as have been proven in other depression trials, where um, you help the person notice what they're doing that they enjoy, and 
how they felt and plan the next time to do it. And, you know, very common sense, but it builds on their sense of, oh, I, there are things that give me pleasure and there are things that I can do and um, that can interact with being in less pain as well. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, another question that had come in before, um, this one is from Laura. Um, I'm going to try to condense it. Um, her in-laws live in a small town eight hours away. Uh, m my husband is their only child. They have major orthopedic problems. In a perfect world, we would live close to them and help them as they age. Um, I worry about their safety and ability to care for themselves. What can we do to help them at a distance? Right. So it goes back a little bit to the safety and autonomy issues. I think partly it's um, what, what do her in-laws want? Um, do they, if, if they're happy living where they um, are, um, then I would suggest that Laura help th have a conversation about what does what do they want to be able to do in their daily lives and what could they what could they do to do those um, it's possible that they are doing exactly what they want or it may be that just you know a ride to a community center once a week would be handy or you know I would suggest that that you really um, try to take apart um, what their favorite things to do would be and try to problem solve with them about how those are possible. Also, of course, um, to combat social isolation, it sounds like they have each other, which is great, um, but if they can, um, you know, FaceTime and other kinds of ways of, of you know, seeing grandkids through the, through the screen can be so much stronger than just a phone call, mm -hmm. for example. You, you, you mentioned problem solving, mm -hmm. and I, I realized that that is something that's utilized in your program mm -hmm. and in other programs mm -hmm. that I've written about. Can you talk about what that consists of? Sure. A again, for people who might want to do it with their own parents. Right. Right. So um, problem solving is a, a um, methodical approach to doing what it sounds like, um, which is um, helping someone figure out what is the problem, you know, and it, um, and making it of the right scope that it's not overwhelming, but it's not so tiny that it's just, you know, done in, in one moment. But it's what is the what is the larger problem? Of the, are they um, feeling like they want to see their friends more, or is it hard for them to get fresh groceries? They only have canned food in their larder, or you know, it could be anything. And then helping them take that apart into its components. What are the barriers? What are the challenges? What are some ideas you have? And then pulling from those those ideas um, and never naysaying the, the ideas. Like at first, it's, you really just want to be brainstorming together ideas um, and then trying to figure out how they could um, come up with a plan that, that works. Right. And in a way, and in doing that, it, it doesn't just solve that problem, it also models for future problems how they could adapt to a different problem. And then they end up feeling like they can actually exactly. take care of it. Right. That it's not insurmountable. Right, exactly. Which is a really important um, feeling. Right. Um, another question I see has come in. Um, if you can't find a program in your area, how do you go about hiring someone to help with caregiving? So um, you may have a better answer for that than, than <laughs> I do. I think it um, there are sort of Uber-like platforms for direct care workers that are that are gaining speed. Um, you can, um, the Area Agency on Aging may have suggestions about um, that if you're part of a faith community, sometimes there are people who either volunteer or are paid, uh, willing to help with caregiving. Um, you know, I would say activate every single resource you have in terms of friends and network to hear how, how they, because unfortunately this is a very common problem. And so you probably work with or know people who have hired caregivers. Right. And there are agencies that through whom you can hire caregivers. Um, you have to pay an agency fee for them. If you want to employ a caregiver directly, um, you have to um, set up an employer-employee relationship. Um, and, you know, that requires some management. Um, so I, I think the idea, it's not easy, but word of mouth, um, good caregivers, I get think, think get shared um, among, um, because they don't tend to stay, you know, terribly long with any one person. So if there was one easy way to do it, um, we would tell you. Unfortunately, um, it, it involves some legwork to see what, works best for you. All right. Um, so let me move on. Um, so 
occupational therapists mm. are part of your program, mm -hmm. and I they also at one point when when my sister was ill, um, she had frontal temporal dementia. An occupational therapist came into her home and proved to be very useful. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about who these professionals are and what they do and in what circumstances they can help older adults? Great. So I'm, I'm not an expert on occupational therapists, but I am a huge fan. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, for any occupational therapist watching, I apologize if I, if I say anything wrong. But um, basically, occupational therapists um, are at the very heart of function and function within an environment. So, for example, if someone breaks their arm and they need to be, they're in school and they need to be able to do their work, then they might have an occupational therapist consult in terms of, okay, this is what the cast is like and this is where what your desk is and how are you going to do this to be able to do that. And um, they, the task analysis is one of the keystones of occupational therapy where they help you figure out exactly what you're doing and how you're doing it and how you need to modify it, at least temporarily. Um, Occupational therapists are not physical therapists. They're different. Sometimes in healthcare, we say OTPT as though they're the same thing, and, and they're not. Um, and um, currently, you can get a referral from a primary care provider for an occupational therapist assessment through Medicare, through Medicare Part B. And um, that's very underused, my understanding is. Um, and that's usually from something reactive, like if someone's at um, risk for falling or they have fallen. But it can be preventive, and I would suggest that people um, utilize that, that benefit. Give me another example of a way, perhaps from what you've seen mm. with your program, of ways in which occupational therapy have ended up, therapists have been able to help older adults. Sure. So, um, for example, a, let's say someone wants to be able to um, take, take a bath safely. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when, when we're young and healthy, we don't think about the importance of hygiene so much. We just do it. But it's very, um, it's, it's an essential part of life and a part of feeling like who you are. Plus, there are hygiene-related diseases one can get. So, for example, we had someone who hadn't been downstairs for two years before we came and um, her main goal was to be able to wash her hair in the kitchen sink. And um, that, to me, was a really good example of why it's important to ask people what they care about, because we would never have walked into her house and said, you should wash your hair in the kitchen sink. <laughs> <laughs> but that was highly motivating to her. And um, together with the occupational therapist, they broke it apart into what would be the aspects of that. So part of that was being able to get downstairs in the first place. As I mentioned, she hadn't been downstairs in two years. She didn't have the strength. She didn't have the leg strength. And um, so to, in this um, problem-solving approach, uh, the, the participant came up with the idea of putting little plastic deck chairs all along the hallway before she got to the stairs so that she could build up her strength over time to be able to um, get down the stairs. So she would go so from one So she would one go from to... one and rest. Okay. And then to the next one and rest. And she practiced that for a month before the occupational therapist came back the next time. She didn't go downstairs on her own. She was too weak. But over the course of the time of the, of the rising up from the chair and sitting back down, which is a fair amount of exercise if you're just sitting otherwise, um, she was able to sit at the top of the stairs. And then we added um, a second banister and some lighting to the stairs. And she could... Um, get all the way down and by the end of the of our time with her she could also then stand at the at the kitchen sink and, and wash her hair and this was this had been her goal and so in terms of your question about the OT it was pulling apart all the parts that would be necessary to be able to do that and then really building on her motivation if we had just said you need to get more exercise that would have fallen on, on I was gonna say blind ears uh, deaf ears <laughs> but um, <laughs> But she was getting a lot more exercise because of what we, we did mm -hmm. with her. But it was really because it was her motivation to wash her hair in the kitchen sink. The other really nice part of that story is that she had been just, um, her bedroom just contained her bed and a commode chair, like a, a toilet chair, and there was no room for another chair. And so she sat on that commode chair all day. Um, and so family members would come say hi to her, but then would leave because it was just kind of awkward and there wasn't room. But now that she can go up and down the stairs, she's downstairs more. And so she's part of the family fabric and she hangs out with the rest of the family. And when her grandchildren come over, they, they spend time with her. And so um, just a, a nice side effect of being able to wash your hair in the kitchen sink. 
A reminder to those who are watching, please send in your questions. Um, we're eager to hear from you. Here's one that um, came in while Sarah was talking. My 95-year-old father needs to walk with a walker but refuses. How do I encourage him to use it? Well, so that's a question that I think many people have. I think um, some people wish their parents would use a cane or a walker. Um, I think that um, you might want to reframe it to understanding what your father would like to be able to do. Is he trying to walk to a particular place? Um, it, so for example, a walker is hard to use to get out the door by yourself, right? You can't go down your front steps if you have front steps with a walker. Um, maybe he's having trouble that way or he, he doesn't he doesn't want to put it in his car. If, if, it's, um, if it's around the place where he lives, maybe he feels that um, kind of couch um, you know, furniture walking, leaning is is furniture surfing is is doing him well. I guess I would I would um, say without knowing him or you, I would say try to understand what makes you want him to have it and what makes him um, not want to, and also um, what he would like to be able to do. Maybe if you can help him see what he that he could do differently if he did use it, he would like to. I I hear a lot from people. Dad won't use a walker. He, he doesn't want to be seen as being old. You know, mom won't use her hearing aids. You know, she doesn't want to acknowledge that she has hearing loss. They isolate themselves in the home and just it, it end up saying essentially no. How do you deal with that internal right. sort of ageist right. that, feelings that, uh, that many pe people seem to have about I don't want to be associated with that. Right. It's very hard. And um, it's, it's so societal. You know, I, ha I have a colleague who, once her husband was in a wheelchair, he's, he would go to the same conferences and no one would talk to him. Mm. And it was, you know, it's a societal thing. It's almost like we're pushing people out of the society if we see that they're old. Mm. And that was at a gerontological <laughs> conference, too. Uh -huh. So... Um, you know, I think people are responding to something that's real, and mm -hmm. it's going to take all of us on different images, not always showing a walker when, we, when we're showing an image of an older adult. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's partly that. I think it's also um, that, that sometimes people um, feel an inevitability. Oh, this is just age. You know, I just can't hear, and that's what happens when you're old. And so partly it's, it's um, sharing information gently that if they could hear, you know, it might help with um, any cognitive loss that they might get. There's a lot more evidence now that hearing loss is very tied to new onset dementia. And so um, sometimes people don't know that. They just think, well, what, why does it matter if I can't really hear much? Um, but so, so some of it is um, sharing education and some of it is just uh, understanding their own priorities, I would say. Yeah. Um, another question, and thank you. Keep them, keep them coming. Um, how do you know if contractors are honest and know enough about aging in place? Right. So, um, so that's two, two questions. I, I would say the know enough about aging in place. There are certifications um, that are um, CAPS certifications where the people go through for um, to to be especially certified in aging in place. Or if they're working with an occupational therapist, then. Basically, the occupational therapist knows the about the aging in place and is is um, providing that guidance to the to the contractor. In terms of if they're honest, I don't have a better answer for you than than for any other kind of contractor. You know, I think their reviews, um, they're you know asking around, um, and there's courses licensing. Most states, you know, you hire a licensed person um, because then that shows that they're bonded and um, you have some recourse. Now, Sarah referred to CAPS. I think that's a Certified Aging in Place Specialist. Thank you. And I think the National Association of Home Builders mm -hmm. has a site where you can look up people locally who have been certified. So Good. that's that's one option. Um, talk about the different kinds of... Your, your program worked with people who had lived in their own homes for a long time. What kind of home modifications and home repairs are often needed by older adults to help them deal with their changing capacity and um, age with independence. Right. So um, some of them are, are just quite common sense, like adding a second banister to um, stairs so that it's easier to sh hold all your weight. 
going down the stairs. And um, I never thought about that even yeah. before. Yeah, I it, wrote that's about huge. Your, really, that's huge. Hmm. And in fact, people tell us often that. Uh, they didn't really think they needed it, but now everyone in the family is using both. Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, because if you're weak on one side, you need it depending on if you're going up or down. Um, and um, people tell us that their three-year-old granddaughters are using the grab bars. Or So, um, you know, some of this is just better for everyone. But um, so grab bars in crucial places where, where balance is important. So people fall in bathrooms, and if they fall in a bathroom, it's much more serious than falling in a living room that might be carpeted, for example. So um, grab bars by the um, by the toilet. I, I once um, went to the door of someone incapable who answered the door in tears, and I was <laughs> nervous about it. And she said, so she'd just been given a raised toilet seat, which just makes the um, makes it so that you don't have to sit down as far to get on the toilet. And she was in tears because she had been trying to restrict her fluids for years because it hurt so much to sit on the toilet and now it didn't. Oh, and she no. was tears of gratitude. Tears of gratitude. And she, um, if you think about it, a toilet is a very low seat that you have to use <laughs> over and over. Um, so raising it, those are some of the common, the uncommon ones are things like a frontal dog carrier, for example. If you have a dog who gets stuck up the stairs and you can put it in, then you've got both hands to go down the stairs. You know, there, there's all kinds of things that the occupational therapists in Capable and other programs can think of if they can really take apart what is the issue. Like, mm. what, is, what, is the, what is the problem that you're trying to, to solve? Okay, interesting. Here's another question. My mother is aging in place in a Brooklyn brownstone with steep stairs. Should I urge her to move or try to make it livable? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. That is a tough one, and I think it's going to be a long conversation. And um, it also may depend. I guess the, the steep stairs are probably on the outside, I'm guessing. Um, and they're probably too steep for a ramp, I'm guessing, because ramps have um, can go up only, an, I think, an inch per foot. Um, but um, so you may have, depending on the age and the health of your mother, you may have a couple of answers for, for different stages of her life. She may, you know, be able to live there another 10 years, making it more livable, and then maybe she may need, may need to move. And that's why we, we try to focus about aging with independence rather than keeping it in place, right? Because what, what, what people want is to, is to live in a community with autonomy. So what would, for you, trigger that it's time to move? It's just so individual. I, I would say if if she is able to do what she would like to do. Well, let's say, um, I'm, I don't know right. um, this person, but let's say that she's no longer really able to get out of the house. Right. Because she can't make it down the stairs. Right. And, and it isn't appropriate for a ramp. Right. Is that a point at which you say... It's it, not worth it anymore? It, well, it's not up to uh, It's really I mean, up to her, right? And right. so it depends on how much she minds about not being able to get out of the house. Mm, interesting. And I think the more and more we have capacity to interact with people um, by distance or, you know, by Alexa, or right. um, that, 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 will, that that will somewhat change as well. Right. But imagine, uh, I mean, my own mother found it hard to walk across the room even to answer a doorbell. Uh -huh. So if she had had groceries delivered, right. even if they rang the doorbell to let them come in and up the stairs, she wouldn't have been able to make it very easily. She, she had um, MS. Um, there are some older people who are that incapacitated, and then others who, um, you know, now with hand, you know, the groceries delivered and far drug stores delivering, and, might be able to live longer in, in these kinds of right. circumstances. Right, and there's more and more ways of being able to unlock your door remotely. You know, because we've had plenty of people who leave their doors unlocked all the time because they're worried they wouldn't be able to answer the door if 911 needed to come, and that is a scary thing for them. Oh, but wow. But as, as we change the way houses are built and over time, that there are many more ways of having latches that you can um, undo remotely. So I think that on its own wouldn't be a reason. Maybe we'll return to that, but okay. another question has come in, so let's deal with that. Transportation is a big issue for older adults. What do you do about that? That is such a huge issue, and um, you, you may know from personal experience, that the questioner, that um, older adults often live seven to ten years past their ability to drive if they were drivers and if they had cars. And so that period of time is can be really tough for them. Um, and so... Um, Lyft and Uber have more and more capacity for having wheelchairs and, um, and walkers. Um, and so for people who can use smartphones, 
those are, are handy. And if you can't, um, there are some services that can be the interface um, with Uber and Lyft um, that doesn't work in rural areas. I think rural and suburban areas are uh, especially uh, have important barriers for transportation for older adults. Um, and if you think about many, many current older adults live in suburbs that they moved to when their kids were young and they may be on their own now and they're at the end of a cul-de-sac and if they can't drive, suburbs were really set up for cars. So we're, we're really at a hard point for that. And um, there's a lot of room for, for innovation. I, th I, don't th I think autonomous cars are a ways off yet and they'll be um, much more expensive than regular cars as well. Right. Another question, um, going back to the woman with the brownstone. I heard your discussion about the woman who couldn't leave her brownstone, but what about if she needs to go see her doctor on a regular basis? Um, so I'm not trying to say people have to stay in their houses no matter what. I'm, I'm more saying that it should be a conversation with the older adult about what they would like. And um, there are many visiting doctor services and visiting nurse practitioners. Services. Specifically in New York, there's a famous, fabulous one with, through the Mount Sinai visiting doctors. But um, we've had people who were, um, who were homebound, or at least it was very difficult for them to get out and wanted to stay in their homes, and we referred them to um, a house calls practice. I just read a piece um, in one of the medical journals about a doctor who realized that his patient could not get to him because the patient was up a flight of stairs and had no way of getting down the stairs. And um, the only, a private ambulance was suggested. Of course, that was too difficult. And in fact, they only carry people up and down stairs in the case of medical emergency. So it was exactly this issue. Right. What if a person needs to get out, can't, doesn't have the ability to get down the stairs in their home to see the doctor? And there are no home-based services available. Right. That is a really right. tough issue. Fortunately, there's an increase in the number of doctors who are making the old-fashioned house calls. Right. And I think there's a recognition that care delivered in the home, especially for very frail older adults, can be the best option. But this is still not as widely available. Right. Although there's more and more telemedicine as well, where people, where the doctor or nurse practitioner isn't there. They're through a screen, and and um, you might think that is um, less friendly, or but um, sometimes people say it's actually better because in a clinic the doctor and nurse practitioner is kind of on their screen, whereas through um, Skype or whatever they would use, it feels more intimate. Right. So maybe a few years down the road there will be a unit set up that's easy to that just a button that you press, and a, a a time is arranged with the doctor, and there can be a consultation. Mm -hmm virtual mm -hmm. consultation just to do an assessment. Right. And then, you know, you only go out if you absolutely need to. I don't know. Right. I mean, some communities are experimenting with um, community EMS systems, you know, like uh, like the people who staff the 911 um, vehicles where um, they might go in and set something up and then they, you could see with so there or community health workers who are facilitating the connection in case the older adult doesn't know how to do that, but then they're having a telepresence with the doctor or nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. I hope that helped answer your question. Mm -hmm. Keep them coming. We like the questions from the audience. Here's one, the, one of mine. It's probably too broad, but <laughs> you can have a crack at it. Um, how, what should baby boomers be thinking about and preparing for as they consider aging with independence? Great. So uh, that is a large question. And um, I think a lot, you know, if you look at the magazines about retirement, they're mostly focused on, on finances, which is important. Um, but I think also getting, having, getting, finding whatever regular activity one likes to do in terms of physical activity that gets your heart rate going a little bit is probably the most important thing baby boomers can do now to get ready for um, for aging with independence. So that means having something that's challenging their body and their mind. Uh, those could be two different, you know, it could be dancing, that might be both, or it could be one, walking and um, playing chess, but that building up so, some cognitive reserve and the um, physical and reserve, I think would be the biggest things that they could do. Um, they could also advocate for policies that um, to create more inclusive um, communities and resources for older adults. And then to take a hard look at um, their resources and their expenses and um, what they can do to make sure they have enough money. Not that aging is all an individual problem, but it is something 
individual things are things we can to an extent control. Okay. Another ca question came in. Thank you. My 87-year-old mo mother eats way too many empty calories. How do I start a conversation about making sure she eats healthier food? Um, so um, food is such a um, cultural and individual um, area that has so much guilt and shame around it as well. And so I think it's, it's difficult to, um, to, to have these conversations. And um, you, it's not necessarily up to family members to have people eat healthier food. I, I think um, depending on whether if you live with her or not, you know, you could bring, you could make sure that there's enough produce around, for example, or maybe she's, um, you know, for example, with the woman, I don't know if you were listening earlier, but we talked about a woman who just had to get on her knees and swipe whatever she could from the fridge. Um, you know, sometimes people are eating empty calories because they're easier and they can't stand long enough to prepare food. So, um, thinking through what kinds of foods are somewhat pre-prepared that are healthier. Um, so there may be many drivers to this eating of empty calories that could be, um, could be thought about in terms of how they could change. I was contacted after I wrote about your program by a woman who lived in a rural area mm -hmm. who said there is no Uber or Lyft to help mm -hmm. older adults um, get to the doctor. There is no grocery store delivery. Mm -hmm. People especially healthy foods are hard to find. Yeah. People are stuck in their apartments, older adults, not able to get to the doctor, not able to go out. We lack these services, what can we do? Yeah. That's uh, It's very hard. Um, right, and so, I mean, depending on the income, you know, Meals on Wheels is, is in every single county and um, an area, and that could potentially be an option. That's also, Meals on Wheels is a wonderful, Thing in terms of social isolation as well. But I think a theme that's coming up that um, applies to your question is mm -hmm. if an older adult really doesn't want to, there's nothing that we can do usually to make them do what they aren't motivated to do or very little right. that is successful. Right. So the key is to find out what's important to them. Exactly. And then to build right. your approach around right. that. And if and if if the eighty seven year old mother has life limiting conditions and she's eating two chocolate bars a day or something, I think that's fine. That's like spending her money, you know, spending her her time as as she wants to. So there would be a lot of dynamics that would go into a conversation like that. Right. And one is her prognosis and right. her life expectancy. Mm -hmm. at, um, so we're talking in many ways about how ill prepared. Mm -hmm. communities are to help older adults because it's both an individual matter, it's a family ma matter, and it's a community matter. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, all of that is embedded within the healthcare care system, right. which nobody understands. Um, <laughs> do you see things changing five, ten years down the road? Is, is, is there any hope of policies that really will change the landscape that we've been talking about? I do. I think there are enough baby boomers with older adult parents um, that the, the political will is starting to get there. I also think that, um, you know, for uh, that we're moving towards um, health care paying for actual health rather than reimbursing for procedures. And that will make a big difference. So it used to be, for example, that, you know, health systems would make money by hip replacements or or even from falls, you know, and, and treating people after something has happened. Now, more and more, um, they're being reimbursed based on the health of a community. And as the health systems are trying to rethink how are we going to keep people healthy, then they're starting to think about some of the non-medical things like transportation, like food, um, like um, do they need to be signed up for food stamps, for example. You may not know this, but less than 50% of older adults who are eligible for food stamps, called SNAP, are on it. And that's an entitlement. And, it, and it, people can just automatically get that if they qualify. So um, a lot of health systems are now starting to say, oh, you haven't been eating, or you've only been eating these empty calories here, let's help you sign up for food stamps so you can get a broader range of resources for your food. So as we do that shift, um, I think there will be significant changes um, for aging because 
um, functionally, uh, older adults who have some functional limitations, like have some difficulty getting out of their house, are much more likely to be hospitalized or be in a nursing home in the next you know, year or two years, and that's preventable. And as the health system starts to figure that out, that's a lot of money to harness into things like transportation or food um, that we haven't traditionally spent money on. And you mentioned earlier that Medicare Advantage plans mm -hmm. now have the ability to offer some of these services. Yeah. And are we going to see more of that, do you think, yes. coming so, f going forward? Yes. So the that change was just announced last year, and the Medicare Advantage plans are just getting ready by June to ask permission for what they can add. So I think we're just at the very June of this year, so it hasn't even really started yet. But I think we'll see a lot of that as the Medicare Advantages try to act in their own interest and in their patients' interest, their covered lives' interest, um, to prevent preventable costly health expenditures. A, a reminder, we're uh, coming you know, near the close of this conversation, but we may have time for a few more questions. So if you have them, please send them in. Um, you've referred. Um, uh, several times to functioning, mm -hmm. which I think is well understood by you and me, but not necessarily sure. by the public mm -hmm. at large. Can you talk about what is meant by functioning sure. and why it's important? Right. Okay, so that's a and great And how question. well the health system right. deals okay. with okay. understanding okay. functioning okay. in older adults? Um, so, um, right, so the basic definition of function, right, would be doing what one wants to, to and needs to be able to do. So this morning, you know, um, everyone who's listening probably got out of the bed. <laughs> they probably went to the bathroom. They probably took a shower or a bath. They got dressed. They ate breakfast. They got out of the house to go to their job or, or whatever that they're doing. All of those entail many, many activities, cognitively and physically. So are you strong enough to stand on one leg to put the other leg into the bathtub? Or are you? can you reach where the cereal is? Or can you put on your clothes comfortably, or is your shoulder frozen? You know, all of those things we kind of take for granted um, when we're able to do them. And, um, and cognitively, we have to think of the order of things. Okay, if you're going to take the train, which train are you catching? And how long do you need to, uh, to count for your walk from the train station to where you're going? And um, so all of those involve function, and they can break down at any point, right? If your shoulder is frozen, if it's hard to bend down, if you're not able to cognitively plan. And um, traditionally, the healthcare system is only focused on function when, there's, um, when something has happened, a bad fall or a heart attack or a hip replacement. But um, part of this, this new movement is to pay attention to function proactively. And people say to us all the time, oh, you're trained to do things when you're young, and no one trains you to grow old. Oh, I um, love that. No one trains you mm -hmm. to grow old. But there's so many things people can do to enhance their function and um, what family members can do. And so um, the, you know, there's a, this is a really modifiable situation. And that's part of why programs like Capable are growing so fast. Right. Oh, a question came in. Thank you again. Um, do you know of successful co-housing initiatives where older adults are able to live independently alongside younger people who are incentivized to live there? Yes, and that, that's a great question and a really burgeoning area. Um, I know in Baltimore there's St. Ambrose housing, um, co-housing. Um, so th there's a couple of different models, and I'm not sure which one the, the questioner is asking about. But so, for example, in Scandinavia, there are, um, you know, the, and, and some places in the U.S., there are buildings and communities that are specifically built for co-housing um, where you may have, you know, one lawnmower and one, you know, uh, one other thing that you use occasionally, and there's communal dining. Um, and and um, in the, the St. Ambrose that I was mentioning is much more a traditional house where maybe a college student or a young adult um, pays nothing for rent or very little for rent, and the older adult has someone there who can, you know, put in the air conditioner in the summer or or just, you know, talk to them some. And, and that usually the programs like that screen both sides and make sure that um, they're, they're amenable to each other and take some kind of responsibility for if it doesn't work out. Um, but those programs are growing, particularly in areas where um, there's housing shortages, you know, like San Francisco or Boston or New York, where it's so costly. Um, it helps both the older adult and the younger adult. It's, it's, a, it's a great idea. Right. So um, I want to go back to this issue of no one teaches us mm -hmm. how to age. Do you have thoughts about what's necessary as this 
enormous population of baby, mm -hmm. baby boomers enters a period where they're going to need more help in terms of understanding how to age, age with independence, right. going back to the very beginning right. of our conversation. Right. So in terms of no one tra t teaches us how to age, um, you know, this is really the first generation where it's so common to live um, to be an older age. That, that, you know, throughout history, we've had people who live to be 100 years old, but they're m much more rare than they are now. And as some people say, we used to die of our first heart attack, and we used to die of our first terrible fall, and um, now we often don't. And, and cancer, you know, we've, we've, we're preventing and curing so many important diseases that what we end, we end up with is um, being in our 80s and 90s um, with not too much wrong with us or, or some, some conditions, but... Um, so that we don't have the historical perspective. We don't have four grandparents who all lived into their 90s and we get to see what worked for them. Um, so this is a whole new frontier. And in terms of aging with independence, um, I guess going back to what we can do societally and communally and individually um, to be able to get the, the biggest reserve we can um, going into going into aging, and then um, making sure that, just going back to some of the themes of the hour, making sure that we are understanding from our family members what they would like to do, how they would like their daily lives to be. Um, maybe they're sitting and watching TV all day. Maybe that's really depressing to them, or maybe that's exactly how they want it. And we can't use our lens to, to decide, but maybe that that's all that they think that they can do, and there's much more that they can do. So there's so much about eliciting what people want to be able to do um, that can change their daily lives. And then, as you say, um, making clear that there that we can modify. We right. can modify either the home envi right. environment or we can modify how people perform activities to allow them to do more. Right. And um, just in our capable program, the budget for the home modification and every day items is only $1,300 per house. And on average, we do about 14 things for that. So some of them are $20 things, $10 things, you know, very simple. It's not like you have to rip up a floor um, to, to make it more um, easy to live independently. Right. And we just saw from a new report from the Commonwealth Fund, which I've written about and the column will appear on Thursday, how, um, in fact, there is growing use of assisted devices. Yes. The, we heard from a viewer who, uh, whose father didn't want to use his wheelchair, but people are using right. all kinds of devices to help right. adapt right. to the challenges they face. Right. So that's another thing as well, right? Yeah, and, and there'll be more and more devices. You know, there's... Um, readers that will read aloud to you based on text that goes in front of it, you know, and um, avatars that can speak to you that's actually someone from another country talking to you, but it looks like a dog or, you know, there's so much coming along that, that could be assistive in terms of social engagement and um, physical activity. So in some ways, it's a hopeful picture, but it clearly we're trotting unknown territory yes. here yes. in terms of the sheer numbers of people mm -hmm. who will be reaching mm -hmm. this stage of life where they need a little bit more help or a lot more help, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily have models for how to do it. Right. And the family structures have changed. Right. And, you know, the, the social surround has changed as well. Well, thank you so much. Oh, it's been my pleasure. For all of your thoughts. Any, anything you want to say in closing? <laughs> um, just in closing, um, although we experience aging in, in, um, in ourselves and in our uh, parents as individuals, this is really a societal problem that we need to solve in terms of um, supports and resources. And it will swamp us if, if we don't think carefully about how to better support uh, family caregivers and other people who are helping people age with independence. Um, I want to thank all the viewers who have tuned in this um, afternoon to this fascinating conversation. <laughs> There's so much more to say, and I know that Sarah's work in this area and my work as a, a writer highlighting it will continue. Thank you so much for, you, for participating <laughs> with us this afternoon. <laughs>